if there's an overproduction of these complexes or a defect in the clearance of normal amine complexes, these can accumulate in tissues and cause tissue injury, particularly in the kidney. Um, and as well as complexes we'll be talking about um, can be deposited in the joints as well. So an example, I mentioned the kidney, um, SLE, it occurs when there are autoantibodies produced to nucleic acids, which would be an example of a systemic immune disease. And here, these ubiquitous autoantigens will form large complexes that the kidney cannot filter out. So this causes kidney damage and often can actually lead to the requirement for a kidney transplant. And here, we can see in this electron microscopy photo, there's actually these very large, dense deposits that get into the tissue. And they build up and can cause inflammation, thereby causing some of the symptoms, such as pain. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about T cell responses against self-antigen. So T cells can really cause direct tissue injury. Um, and they can also provide help for B cells that are producing autoantibody. However, unlike antibodies, where you can transfer the antibody from either one mouse to another or through the placenta, T cells often cannot be transferred because of MHC restriction. So even if you take T cells from one individual and transfer them to another, those T cells may not actually be able to recognize any antigen because they're not seeing that antigen in the context of the correct MHC molecule. Um, T cells also, unlike antibodies, cannot be used to stain tissues to look at where those antibodies bind. So for example, in um, tissues where you take an autoantibody against nucleic acids, like that's found in SLE, you can take that antibody and fluorescently stain it to see where it localizes within the tissue. Therefore, that helps you narrow down what that antibody is actually recognizing. T cells, however, don't have the same um, convenience. So there are now some ways to study what T cells are recognizing using peptide MHC tetramers in flow cytometry. However, it's definitely not as straightforward. Um, antigen that's recognized by CD4 T cells can also be identified by adding antigen containing tissue or cells to patient blood. And there we can see the um, CD4 T cell response to that antigen. However, again, CD8 T cells don't work for this technique because the antigen must be presented to them in the context of MHC1, which is not found on all cells, as you guys talked about before. So CD8 T cells need to see the autoantigen in the context of MHC1 on antigen presenting cells. Again, further complicating this. So an example of a disease that's typically thought of to be mediated by T cells is multiple sclerosis. So here T cells recognize and destroy the myelin coating of nerves in the central nervous system. So MS typically shows what's known as a relapsing remitting pattern, which means that patients may have a flare of symptoms, but then these symptoms might improve for a period of time. However, after a while, these symptoms might come back. So that's the relapsing remitting pattern. However, over time, um, especially over years of having this disease, the relapsing remitting um, pattern can cause progressive tissue damage, and therefore, overall, a slow decline in tissue function. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is similar. So it's characterized by inflammation of the synovial lining of the joint. 
And here, I mentioned with immune complexes that these complexes can be deposited in the joints, um, and this can cause inflammation and pain. In RA, the synovium is actually attacked by autoreactive CD4 T cells that activate macrophages. So then this leads to a um, positive feedback loop of inflammatory cytokines, more cells being recruited, and more tissue damage. Okay, so, so far we've talked about autoimmunity as a disease caused by the breakdown of tolerance. Um, for this, it would really be beneficial to go back and look at your lectures on central tolerance of T and B cells. So um, we didn't have time to go through all of that again. But auto, autoimmune diseases might be systemic or organ specific. So an example of a systemic autoimmune disease would be SLE, where autoantibodies are reactive against nucleic acid, which is found in every cell in the body. Conversely, we might see organ specific disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis, which affects the joints, or type 1 diabetes, which affects the pancreas. Then we've also talked about examples of how inflammation can become a positive feedback loop. When antigen is recognized but cannot be cleared because it is part of the cell, um, this can lead to epitope spreading and increased inflammation. We've also seen that autoimmune diseases can be caused by autoantibody effector T cells or more commonly actually a combination of these. And tissue destruction can occur through direct T cell killing as well as phagocytosis, complement, and other mechanisms that you guys have talked about previously. And this really depends on the location. Okay, so now we're going to take a step back and talk a bit about the genetic and environmental factors that can lead to the development of autoimmunity. So autoimmune diseases actually have a very strong genetic component. For example, inbred nod mice are predisposed to develop type 1 diabetes. So you can see here in figure 1531, we have um, over time, so this is age and weeks, and this is the incidence of diabetes in a group of nod mice. So we can see over time, um, more and more of these nod mice just by themselves develop type 1 diabetes. We can also see that autoimmunity is much more common in females than in males. The extent to which this is true varies depending on the disease. For example, type 1 diabetes um, typically has a bit more even breakdown of male to female, but SLE has, um, I believe it's about a 70% incidence rate in females. And you can see this in our nod mice as well. The female mice in red have a much more um, common predisposition to developing diabetes. So we can also do studies where we look at gene mutations, both in humans and in mice, where we can do gene knockouts, that can help provide us information. So this is similar to what we talked about in the immunodeficiency lecture, where we talked about specific gene mutations in the immune system that can lead to immunodeficiency as well as autoimmunity. So multiple diseases may actually share gene association. And interestingly, many risk alleles, so areas of the genome that are associated with a risk of developing autoimmunity, are in non-coding regions of the genome. And in particular, these seem to be found frequently in gene regulatory elements. So these are areas that help control gene expression in immune cells, as well as in promoter regions. And we can look at this by what's called a Manhattan plot. So here um, on the x-axis, we have the different areas along 
and number on the chromosome. So each color is a different chromosome. Then we have the incidence rate in association with that region of the genome with our disease. So these peaks, which would be the skyscrapers in a city like Manhattan, hence the name Manhattan plot, show genes that are highly associated with development of the disease. So many of these genes might actually affect mechanisms of tolerance. So, for example, um, autoantigen availability and clearance might be affected. So if you can't clear antigen that's released after tissue damage, then this might lead to greater chances of autoimmunity. There's also the possibility that defects in genes regulating apoptosis can have the same effect. If signaling thresholds are mutated, especially if the threshold is lowered so signaling is more likely, this can lead to autoimmunity. And if you think about signaling and activation of T and B cells, this makes sense because if it's easier to activate a T cell or a B cell, you're much more likely that those autoreactive cells will become active and lead to the development of disease. We also see an association with genes that are important for cytokine expression. And again, this really plays into our positive feedback loops. As if you have more inflammatory cytokines, you're more likely to have recruitment of an immune response. And similarly, co-stimulatory molecules can have an effect. And defects in regulatory T cells are also very important. So Tregs, as you guys have talked about in previous lectures, will help to control an immune response. So if these cells don't work, it's more likely that a damaging self-reactive response will go uncontrolled. And centrally, um, as you guys talked about before again, the thymus is really important for controlling tolerance. And also apoptosis regulators are important for removing self-reactive lymphocytes. So in the bone marrow or the thymus, these self-reactive lymphocytes are typically removed by um, induced apoptosis. However, if there is a gene defect in this mechanism, those cells may not be removed. So here's um, another summary chart where we can see many of the different genes that are important for tolerance. So you might recognize AIR, which is very important um, in the expression of self-antigens in the thymus, which helps remove self-reactive cells, as well as FOXP3, which is very important for regulatory T cell development. Interestingly, also, MHC genes are very important for understanding disease susceptibility. So MHC loci actually are one of the top hits in genes that contribute to susceptibility to autoimmune diseases, especially MHC2, which really implicates CD4 T cells in many of these diseases. In humans, we see particularly that the HLA DR2 allele has a protective effect against autoimmune disease development. And this is really thought to be due to the differential ability of MHC to present different peptides. So autoantigen peptides are typically expressed at low levels. So if you have a mutation in this or an increased um, ability to present the peptides, that could lead to more autoimmunity. So we see here a graph of in siblings that share HLA haplotypes, and this is in type 1 diabetes. So if these siblings had um, one or two HLA haplotypes shared, we would expect to see this in blue, where the percentage of the siblings that share um, type 1 diabetes would um, correspond to the prevalence of these alleles.
However, we actually see a much higher incidence of susceptibility between siblings that share two HLA alleles. And this is really interesting. This is looking at HLA DR2. And here we have the crystal structure. And you can see this um, HLA DR2 is associated with resistance to type 1 diabetes. And here you can see the binding of certain peptides. However, if you have an HLA haplotype that is associated with susceptibility to type 1 diabetes, it's possible that the peptide cleft here will be a different shape or have differential binding. Therefore, the same peptide may not be able to be produced or vice versa. The peptide may be more likely to be presented. So this is thought to be one reason why the HLA haplotypes are so important, but more research is needed to understand this better. So we've talked a lot about the adaptive immune system. However, the innate immune system also can be very important for the development of autoimmune disease. So for example, the gene NOD2, um, which is part of the innate system, as you guys have talked about previously, mutations here can actually lead to prevalence of Crohn's disease. And this is thought to be uh, because in Crohn's disease, um, there is a defect in the sequestration of microbiota. So the immune response launches too strong of a response to the microbes that are actually healthy. And this leads to a positive feedback loop of inflammation and the formation of granulomas where macrophages come in, they try to clear an antigen, but they cannot, and they form these large clusters. This is also seen in tuberculosis. So NOD2 defects might also um, be related to CXCL8 defects. And CXCL8 is important for neutrophil recruitment. So if you have a mutation in CXCL8, it's possible that this will lead to increased cell recruitment and tissue damage. Okay, so we've talked about the genome, but what external conditions can initiate autoimmunity? So we see that there are longitudinal studies showing correlation of autoimmunity and the environment. It's possible this is due to vitamin D levels, but the microbiota might also play a role, as well as toxins and infection. So we'll first talk about infection, but with these different um, examples, I want you guys to think about twin studies. So we'll touch on this a little bit more, but identical twins share a genome. However, it's not guaranteed that if one twin develops an autoimmunity disease, the other twin will also develop that disease. So there has to be something else going on. An example would be infection. So infection provides a pro-inflammatory environment. So this can help promote lymphocyte activation overall. There's also going to be increased release of inflammatory mediators and increased expression of molecules important for co-stimulation. So this can actually lead to bystander activation of self-reactive lymphocytes. And cytokines can also suppress regulatory T cell function. We also see that microbial ligands stimulate parts of the innate immune system, such as macrophages and dendritic cells, through TLR receptors. And this leads to overall inflammatory cytokine release. So here we have a few examples. Um, we talked earlier about different tissues that are sequestered from the immune system. So if you have disruption of that barrier, this can lead to release of self-antigen that typically is sequestered and therefore may not be used to eliminate self-reactive cells. Um, this is an example in diseases of the eye, where if you have an eye injury, this release of self-antigen can lead to an autoimmune response that attacks the eye.
And we'll talk a bit more about molecular mimicry in the next slide. Okay, so what's molecular mimicry? It's the cross-reactivity between different antigens, particularly between a foreign and a self antigen. And this molecular mimicry is when a pathogen expresses an antigen that resembles host molecules. And it has to be similar enough to be detectable by either the same antibody, same T cell. Um, and for T cells, you actually have to keep into account that not only must the structure be similar for antibody recognition, the peptides must also be similar for T cell activation. So a really common example of this is rheumatic fever after strep infection. So here we have the strep bacteria um, that is recognized by antibody by the plasma cells, but then some of these antibodies also recognize antigens in the heart. So when these antibodies are being produced, they can enter the heart and recognize heart valves, which then leads to tissue damage. Um, this is also can happen when low affinity self-reactive B and T cells are not efficiently removed via tolerance mechanisms. And the right conditions, combinations of these different environmental factors, molecular mimicry, can lead to activation. Autoimmunity caused by self-reactivity actually often stops when the infection ends. So unlike um, some of the positive feedback we saw with um, self-reactive infl inflammatory responses, where the antigen can never be cleared because it is essential, in cases of molecular mimicry, the pathogen actually can be cleared. Therefore, the immune response will eventually decrease, and typically the autoimmune response decreases as well. So example of this is Lyme arthritis. So with infection with Lyme's disease, it's possible that due to molecular mimicry, this leads to um, joint swelling and pain. However, when the bacteria is eventually cleared, typically this arthritis also um, recedes. So drugs and toxins can actually cause autoimmunity as well. So some drugs can induce autoantibodies. Um, in particular, there's one drug um, that's used for heart arrhythmias that is known to cause this. However, this drug is typically no longer prescribed due to this risk. Heavy metals such as gold or mercury can lead to autoimmunity in mice, although this is not well understood in humans. So some drugs may actually react with self-protein. And this would lead to a haptinated self-protein. So you guys discussed earlier haptins or different molecular modifications that can be used um, to study an immune response. So if a drug actually comes and reacts with a protein and therefore changes it enough, the immune system may no longer recognize it as self. It may mount an immune response to that new region, that haptin. Finally, we have to consider that actually just random events may contribute to autoimmunity. So it's possible that development of an autoimmune disease requires a combination of the different factors we've discussed. So for example, autoreactive B and T cells have to interact during an infection for this to lead to autoimmunity. If you have only one of these cells recognizing a self antigen, they should be eliminated if peripheral tolerance is operating correctly. The genetic predisposition can also increase the chances of autoimmunity. However, um, certain genes typically do not uh, mean that there's a 100% chance that the individual will develop the disease. Usually these genetic mutations lead to just a predisposition, so it's, it's more likely that individual might develop the disease.
And it's possible. So many autoimmune diseases have a later onset, so in early adulthood. And it's possible that you just need an accumulation of random events to occur before the disease can happen. So you might need um, a combination of an inflammatory environment with the particular autoreactive cells that all have to come together at the same time. And all these um, different things will add up until later in life, the autoimmune disease will appear. So to summarize the environmental and genetic factors, many of autoimmune diseases have a strong genetic component, particularly with tolerance genes and MHC alleles. Infection can also trigger autoimmunity, particularly with molecular mimicry and cross-reactivity by antibodies. And also, this can happen through similar peptides being presented to T cells. And then we also have environmental triggers that can cause autoimmunity, such as medications or toxins. And finally, it's possible that just random events may lead to the development of autoimmunity. So to summarize overall what we've talked about today, autoimmunity occurs after a breakdown in tolerance. And diseases may be systemic or organ specific, depending upon the location of the self antigen. Epitope spreading and positive feedback of an inflammatory response can also lead to or exacerbate autoimmunity. Then tissue destruction can occur by immune complexes, um, direct killing, or a complement response. And instead of destruction of cells, some autoantibodies can block the function of receptors, which causes symptoms of the disease, such as we saw in myasthenia gravis. Then many autoimmune diseases also have a strong genetic component. And finally, diseases may be triggered by infection, environmental toxins, or just through an accumulation of random events. So this will wrap up our lecture on autoimmunity. Again, I'd encourage you guys to go back and review mechanisms of tolerance. And the most important thing for this lecture is really thinking about the mechanisms behind different diseases. You don't need to memorize the diseases, but just use these as examples of um, problems with the immune system to help you understand normal immune function. So, thank you.